Good morning, everyone. It's indeed my great pleasure and privilege to be here. What I'm going to tell you about is a little bit on one of the most beautiful minds of the past century, namely that of Albert Einstein, and his famous equation, E is equal to mc square, the manifestation of that, the consequences of that. <clears throat> In the year 1999, just when the century ended, the American Time magazine asked for nominations for the Person of the Century Award. And as you can imagine, there were hundreds of nominations made, and they had a tough time to decide on the finalists. There were three finalists. The first one was Franklin Roosevelt for triumph for freedom over fascism and communism. About him, Bill Clinton wrote, when our children's children read the story of the 20th century, they will see that above all, it is the story of freedom's triumph, the victory of democracy over fascism, of tolerance over prejudice, and they will see that the embodiment of that triumph was President Franklin Roosevelt. And the second finalist was our own Mahatma Gandhi, as the embodiment of human rights and his faith in nonviolence. In the same issue of Time magazine, Johanna Magheri wrote, in an age of empire and military might, Mahatma Gandhi proved that the powerless had power and that force of arms would not forever prevail against force of spirit. That is so important for all of us. Our passionate commitment, nonviolent activism, willingness to accept punishment for civil disobedience were lessons that Mahatma Gandhi taught. Martin Luther King learned them, so did Nelson Mandela, Lesh Valenza, the unknown Chinese who defied the tanks in 1989. And Gandhi is that rare great man held in universal esteem, a figure lifted from history to moral icon. But the person who was chosen as the person of the century was Albert Einstein. About him, Frederick Golden wrote, Einstein was the preeminent scientist in a century dominated by science. The touchstones of the era, the atomic bomb, the Big Bang, quantum physics, and electronics all bear his imprint. He was the embodiment of pure intellect. He was unfathomably profound. The genius among geniuses who discovered merely by thinking about it that the universe was not as it seemed. Although he was really a genius among geniuses, he did very well in college, but he had great difficulty in finding a teaching job in a school. And therefore, after a large number of unsuccessful, it's a lesson for all of us that failures do not matter. We have to keep trying. And eventually in 1905, when Einstein was 26 years old, and while working in total isolation, not in an university, not in a research laboratory, but in the Swiss patent office, all by himself, he published five outstanding papers. These five papers are often referred to as the Anus Mirabilis papers. Anus Mirabilis are Latin words meaning miraculous year. And therefore, the year 1905 is known as Einstein's year of miracles. The year 1666 was the year of miracles for Isaac Newton, when the University of Cambridge closed down because of the plague in the United Kingdom. And Newton was sent home and there, in total isolation, he wrote down the laws of motion, of the planetary motion. He worked out a theory of optics. And also, he introduced the calculus. <clears throat> in the five papers that he published, the first one was on a new method for determination of molecular dimensions, the size of water molecules, for example, how big it is. He gave a very beautiful method for the determination of that size. In the second paper, which was revolutionary in nature, he said radiation, that is light, can be emitted or absorbed only in discrete amounts. 
called quanta, packets of energy. And the value of that energy was proportional to the frequency nu of the radiation that is emitted. And these quanta are now known as photons. This was a revolutionary concept because at that point of time, Maxwell's electromagnetic wave theory, that light was a wave phenomenon, was very well accepted. And this eventually led to what is known as the wave particle duality and the development of quantum theory. Quantum theory has been a revolution in the, in the past century. And that was introduced by, by Albert Einstein in the year 1905. And in the third paper, Albert Einstein gave a very beautiful theory of Brownian motion, which involves the, the movement of a big particle by continuous collisions with many smaller molecules of a gas. The smaller molecules in this video is shown by tiny dots, and a big particle like a virus will make random movement. And it is this random movement of which he gave a very beautiful theory. In his fourth paper, he put forward the special theory of relativity, which implied that time is not absolute. If I go from here on a fast aircraft and come back, my watch will show a slightly different time than yours. And in the fifth paper, he introduced the famous equation E is equal to mc squared. And this equation has become so famous that many have put on their shirt, many have tattooed them on their back or front. So in the preface of the book, which has the title of E is equal to mc squared, a biography of the world's most famous equation, David Budanis, the author, writes, a few years ago, I was reading an interview with the actress Cameron Diaz in a movie magazine. At the end, the interviewer asked her if there was anything she wanted to know. And she said she would like to know what E is equal to mc squared really means. They both laughed, then Diaz mumbled that she had meant it. And then the interview ended. So if a beautiful actress like Cameron Diaz wants to know what really E is equal to mc squared, means, so I thought people in, at large, public at large, would be interested to know, and that is the purpose of this talk. And this equation implies the equivalence of mass and energy, and that mass can be converted to energy and vice versa, and the manifestations of this beautiful principle. So let us consider two magnets facing each other, with having an exact mass, each having an exact mass of one kilogram, and when they attract and get stuck together, then their mass, total mass, is slightly less. And this, we assume, let us suppose, a loss of mass of about a millionth of a gram, and which is a billionth of a kilogram. Then when the two magnets join together, there is a slight change in the mass. And if I multiply with the square of the velocity of light, which is 300 million meters per second, we find that in the process of the two magnets hitting, a 90 million joules of energy will be released. And this energy will be released in the form of heat because they, they will hit together with a tremendous velocity. Thus, a loss of mass of about one millionth of a gram will correspond to a release of about 90 million joules of energy. On the other hand, when the two magnets are stuck together, it will require about 90 million joules of energy, which will be supplied by your muscles, to separate them. And in the process, a tiny amount of mass will be created. So that if two magnets are stuck together, a strongly bound system, if you make it a loosely bound system, you will have to do work on it. And when you, do, when you supply energy, a small amount of mass gets created. To give you an idea what one joule is, a 100 watt bulb gives out 100 joules of energy per second. Now any atom consists of a tiny nucleus which is at the center of the atom, which has, occupies a very, very small space, and which consists of neutrons and protons held together by strong nuclear forces. In the diagram, 
the lithium atom consists of three electrons orbiting around a nucleus which consists of three protons and four neutrons. So the simplest nucleus is the deuteron nucleus, which consists of a proton and neutron and uh, stuck together. And therefore, because there will be a certain amount of energy that is required to separate them, if they are separated, then that will weigh more than the deuteron nucleus itself. And in the process, in the, so the energy released when they get stuck together is 2.23 million electron volts. Million electron volt is an energy that nuclear physicists use, which is about one-tenth of a trillionth of one joule. So you will have to supply a certain amount of energy to make a tightly bound system like the deuteron nucleus to go over to a loosely bound system, thereby creating a small amount of mass. And similarly, if a loosely bound system goes over to a tightly bound system, certain amount of energy is released. So you have the famous fusion reaction in which you have a deuteron nucleus which consists of a proton and neutron and a tritium nucleus, which consists of one proton and two neutrons, they fuse together. And this fusion takes place at extremely high temperature because these are both positively charged particles. They repel, and so they fuse together and to form a neutron and an alpha particle. In the beginning, you have three neutrons and two protons. And in the, in the end, you also have three neutrons and two protons except for the fact that the alpha particle is very tightly bound. And so therefore, therefore, there is a loss in mass and a considerable amount of energy is emitted in the form of kinetic energy, motion energy associated with the alpha particle and the neutron. The binding energy of the deuteron is 2.23 mF, of the tritium is 8.48, so the total binding energy is 10.7 million electron volts. That is 10.7 million electron volts will be required to separate all the five particles. On the other hand, the binding energy of the alpha particle is very large. That is a very tightly bound nucleus. And in the process, therefore, 17.6 MeV of energy will be released, which is in the form of heat. So that if you have such reactions, then heat will be generated although the number of neutrons and protons remain the same. Such fusion reactions therefore require very high temperature. Our sun is like a 400 trillion trillion watt light bulb. Therefore, it emits 400 trillion trillion joules of energy per second. And if we now use the equation, we will find that the mass that is continuously getting converted to energy is four billion kilograms per second. So in one second, the sun is losing mass of the order of four billion kilograms. And so therefore, every year, about 120,000 trillion kilograms of mass is continuously getting converted into energy. This is a huge amount of mass, but the sun is so big that the fractional change is extremely small. So initially, our sun this consists of hydrogen atoms and which attracted each other, gravitational pull, and as they collapsed, a loosely bound system went over to a tightly bound system creating heat. So it became hot and it became so hot that the fusion reaction started. We are at this moment about 4.5 billion years and as, we, as the nuclear fuel inside the sun gets exhausted, the gravity will not be able to hold it together, and it will form a red giant in about five billion years, and will envelop the Earth. And then astrophysicists tell us that in another five billion years, it will collapse to form what is known as a white dwarf star. So in a later statement explaining the ideas expressed by the equation E is equal to mc square, Einstein summarized, these are Einstein's own words, which you can see on YouTube. It followed from the special theory of relativity that mass and energy are both but different manifestations of the same thing. 
a somewhat unfamiliar conception for the average mind. Furthermore, the equation E is equal to mc square, in which energy is put equal to mass, multiplied by the square of the velocity of light, showed that very small amount of mass may be converted into a very large amount of energy and vice versa. If we have uncontrolled fusion reactions, we have what is known as the hydrogen bomb, which is threatening mankind today. On the other hand, if we have controlled fusion reactions, we have what is known as the fusion reactor, which is the future of energy generation process. And we have unlimited supply of fusion power ahead of us. Right now, extensive research is going on in two different types of fusion reactors. One in which the fusion system consists of powerful laser beams, a large number of laser beams, light beams, are focused and, and onto the target and creating extremely high temperature and generation of what is known as fusion power. This photograph is the setup at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in the United States, which can deliver more than 500 trillion watts of peak power to the target. And this is the second. The other device is known as the tok tokamak, which uses a powerful magnetic field to confine a plasma in the shape of a torus for producing controlled thermonuclear fusion power. In fact, as most of you would know, that India is a very active partner in that. And we I hope, I sincerely hope, in my lifetime, I'm able to see the fusion reactors in operation. So as Budanis, in the same book on E is equal to mc square writes, it is as if when God created the universe, he had said, I'm going to put X amount of energy in this universe of mine. So when he created this universe, he had put a certain amount of energy into this universe. I will let stars grow and explode. There will be fires, explosion of volcanoes. Despite all these variations, the total amount of energy will remain the same. So there will be continuous transformation from energy to mass and from mass to energy. The amount I created at the beginning will not change. There will not be one millionth part less than what was there to start. So with that, I end my lecture. Thank you very much.